2. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. And we're going over verses 1 to 9, 1 to 10 there. And uh, so we want to start there, 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 10. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And that, now, doctrinally, this is talking about the tribulation, but folks, this is what's going on today. People don't receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. Yeah. All right, they, they, you talk to them about getting saved, they say, well, I've been baptized. Well, I joined a church. Yeah. I got my own religion. See, they, they don't love truth. The truth is Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Yeah. Yeah. So you've got to co go through Jesus Christ. Yeah. But they want, to, they want to go up, they want to climb up some other way and Jesus said in John 10 that we climb up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. So uh, people, uh, they don't, verse 10 says, and with all deceivableness of, of unrighteousness. See that word unrighteousness? You see it again in the end of verse 12. But it had pleasure in unrighteousness. See verse 12, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Verse 10, they don't receive the love of the truth. Verse 12, they all might be damned who believe not the truth. The problem is that they don't want the truth. Yeah. And we've gone over that a million times. Yeah. The problem is people don't want the truth. It's a heart problem. Yeah. All right. People say, I've been baptized. Yeah, but Jesus said, you have to receive him. Ah, I got my own religion. They don't want the truth. And the Lord will have no, and I'm not trying to be mean, I'm just telling you the truth. The Lord will have no problem at all in casting them in a lake of fire. Because if you see what Jesus Christ, the Son of God, went through for you and I, all the torture and pain and suffering, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten yeah. Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life, yeah. John 3, 16. And then for a person to say, no, I got my, I, I, I got it. I got, I'm all right. Yeah. I'm good. I'm good. They won't be good when they're burning in hell. Mm -hmm. yeah. They won't be able to say, I'm good. They'll say, I'm burning. Uh, verse 11, for this cause, God, not the devil, God, shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. People don't want the truth. I gave you the verses. Well, I don't need to go over them again. I want to move along here. 1 Kings 22 and Ezekiel 14. When a person's got set up idols in their heart, Ezekiel 14, they got idols in their heart. They, they got little quirky, quacky, kooky, quacky, kooky, quacky, kooky, quacky things in their heart. Why they don't want to get saved. Why they don't want to serve God. They got all kinds of excuses and all kinds of junk and all kinds of baloney and everything else. There's a judgment time. Yeah. And all that baloney will mount to baloney at the judgment. Whether it's unsaved people rejecting Christ or Christians at the judgment seat of Christ. God has a plan. He didn't plan around. He's got us a Bible here that we can know the truth if we want it. And people don't want truth. That's what we're preaching. That's what it says here in these verses. That's the whole problem. People say, I didn't know. You could have known. There's, Bi there's a Bible on every dime store counter. There's a Bible. Most people, unsaved people, have at least one or two Bibles in their home. All right? The people don't want truth. They don't seek truth. They don't, they don't want to hear the truth of the Word of God. They don't love truth. They're not zealous for truth. They don't want to study the Bible. They don't want to hear preaching and teaching of the Word of God. They don't want to learn more about God. They don't want to learn more about the Bible. They don't care. Okay. Don't cry on my shoulder at the judgment. Uh, verse 12, that they all might be damned. That's going to hell right there. Who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So we went over that. Verse 13. Let's, let's move on here. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Now, there's a hyper-Calvinist verse. They love that verse. They say, see, here's how they read it. Because God hath from the beginning 
chosen you before the foundation of the world to salvation. No. He's chosen you, if, in verse 13, have from beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. When did you believe the truth? Not before the foundation of the world. I believed the truth on June 16, 1977. That's when I got saved. Sanctification of the Spirit, that's when I got the Spirit and belief of the truth. When I believed the truth, I got the Spirit of God inside of me. I sealed with the Holy Spirit of God. Amen. But God said, way back, way back, He said, I'm going to send my Son, and I've predestinated those that get in my Son who repent and receive Christ and get born again, get in me. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. That get in my Son, I'm going to predestinate them to be conformed to the image of my dear Son, uh, the Son of God. Those that, Jesus said, thousands and thousands of years ago, before the foundation of the world, he said, those that uh, repent, receive Christ, and get saved, uh, I'm going to... Uh, uh, if they get in Christ, then they're predestinated. Look at uh, 1 Peter. Instead of me trying to say it, why don't we just turn to the verse. 1 Peter 1, 1 Peter 1, 5. Uh, or, I'm sorry, 1 Peter 1, 2. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father. 1 Peter 1, verse 2. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father. See, it's foreknowledge. Through sanctification of the Spirit. That's the exact same thing he said in 2 Thessalonians 2.13. Through sanctification of the Spirit. Sanctification of the Spirit, when did you get Spirit? When you got saved. And to obedience, when did you obey the gospel? When you got saved. And sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you, peace be multiplied. Notice the elect according to the foreknowledge of God. God had a foreknowledge. God knew who was all going to get saved a billion years ago. He knew when you were going to get be born of your mother's womb. He knew that you were going to get saved when you got saved. That still doesn't do, do away with the fact that he gives you a will to get saved. Yeah. See, people don't understand that. <clears throat> God not only, this is going to really rattle your brain. God not only knows what's going to happen before it happens. God knows what would have happened if what's going to happen doesn't happen. Yeah. Woo! Yeah. Think about that for about 38 years. <laughs> yeah. God not only knows what is going to happen before it happens, God knows what would have happened if what's going to happen doesn't happen. You can't put God in a box. No. 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 You see, like a man, he's going out, he's going out of a church one day and he had steps in the front. And he went down the steps. It's a cold, uh, snowy day, icy day. Snow and ice, a little bit of snow and ice on the steps there. And he slid all the way down the steps. And he got up, patted himself off, and he goes, "Well, thank God that's over with. Like that was predestinated to happen. Like that had to happen. Well, it might not have happened if he'd have been a little bit more careful. See, you say, well, what happens if he wouldn't have slipped down the steps? God would have known that too. Yeah, yeah. You see what I'm saying? God gives you a will. God gives human beings a will. That's why he can cast people into hell. Because they will, and you will not come unto me that you might have life, Jesus said in John 5, 40. Folks, if hyper-Calvinists are right, how can God legitimately, honestly, sincerely, how can he cast somebody into hell when they didn't have a will to receive Christ? That's a perverted God. That's an unjust God. You mean we don't have a will to receive Christ, but God's still going to cast us into hell because we weren't one of God's elect? That is a damnable, rotten, Amen. putrefying doctrine. Yeah. And what it does, it takes away the responsibility on the human being and puts it on God. I can't tell you the number of people since I've been saved, that I, especially older men, I say, are you saved, sir? Well, the way I look at it is, preacher, when God gets ready to save me, he'll save me. I heard that. And they say that, they say that, Brother Johnson, like they've said something profound. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they said something that was absolutely stupid and ignorant. They're putting it all on the Lord. No, your salvation depends on you, whether you want to repent and receive Christ as your personal Savior. Yeah. Amen. Amen. 
God couldn't justly cast people into hell if, he, if they didn't have a will to get saved. Yeah. What are we even doing here tonight? Let's just go home and twiddle our beads. If what's going to happen is going to happen in the elect, these people are elected to be saved before the foundation of the world, and these people are elected to be damned, and nobody can do anything about it, what are we doing anything for? Brother Aaron, you wasted your time today going out passing out flyers for the revival. If they're right, but they're not right. Yeah. Why do anything? Yeah. It produces a fatalistic Christianity. And that's why most of those hyper-Calvinist churches are deader than a hammer. Not only are they deader than a hammer, but they're, there's, no, there's no evangelistic fervor. There's no evangelistic witnessing because whoever's going to be saved is going to be saved. Now, look at, uh, I gave you 1 Peter 1. Uh, all right, first, or 2 Thessalonians 2, 13. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brother and beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief the truth. Now, look at Ephesians 1, 4. Ephesians 1, 4, back a few pages. Ephesians 1 4, chapter 1, verse 4. Here's not only 1 Peter 1, verse 2, but Ephesians 1 4 is another verse they use that they pervert the scriptures. Folks, every false heretic, false church religion, false doctrine, everybody that promotes all these false religions, churches, cults, false doctrines, everything, they take the scriptures and they rest the scriptures to their own destruction. Yeah. I'm telling you. And they're, they, I wonder how many souls have been damned in the past 100 years, 200 years, because of this hyper-Calvinist doctrine. Now, uh, they, they believe in being saved, but they just believe that those that are elect are going to be saved, those that aren't, they're going to be damned. And that's a, that, that's a fatalistic Christianity. That is a damnable doctrine. Ephesians 1.4, According as he hath ch chosen us in him, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Notice the key words in verse 4. According as he hath chosen us, they read it, according as he hath chosen us before the foundation of the world. No. According as he hath chosen us in him. God says, thousands of years ago, he said, I'm going to send my son, he's going to die on the cross, live a, live a sinless life, but so forth and so on. Death, burial, resurrection, send back up to God the Father. And whoever puts their faith in my son and repents of their sins and receives Christ, before the foundation of the world says, those that get in my son, in Christ, I have predestinated them to be uh, conformed to the image of my dear son. And according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, he chose us. Notice the phrase, in him. Election, predestination, adoption, uh, and, all, and the Christian's inheritance are all conditioned on being in Christ. This verse is one of the uh, root uh, verses and sources of Calvin's, John Calvin's hogwash. It's linked with some verses in Romans, which we've gone over in our verse-by-verse -verse study uh, in Romans, and uh, that you were that they, they, they use it to prove that you were saved before Adam showed up, before the foundation of the world, you were saved. All right, even though you were damned after Adam sinned. For as in Adam, all die. Even so, in Christ shall we made alive, 1 Corinthians 15, 22. So what they're saying is, you were in Christ before the foundation of the world. Well, then Adam sinned, and then you were out of Christ. And then when you got saved, you got back in Christ. It's a bunch of junk. Yeah. It's a bunch of junk. Calvinists read the verse as though you were actually in Jesus Christ before the foundation of the world, which is nonsense. No one was in Christ before Genesis 1-1 because he had no body to be in. If any man was, then in Genesis 3-6, he got in Adam when Adam sinned and plunged the whole human race into sin. This means he was in Christ, then fell out of Christ into Adam, and then fell out of Adam back into Christ. Scripturally, no person is in Christ until he trusts Christ as his Savior. The same chapter, Ephesians 1, look down at verse 13. 
Ephesians 1.13, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Not before the foundation of the world, it's when you got saved. In whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Amen. It's when you got saved. You see how they see how they pervert the scriptures? But I'm telling you what, they can present it, and if you don't know the Bible, and of course the average person in America don't know the Bible. You know why the average Christian in America, person in America don't know the Bible? Because they spend 8, 10, 12 hours a day yeah. on this. <laughs> I see them all the time everywhere. I mean, honestly, they do this. Yeah, driving. <laughs> See the facial expression? They got it. They messy and made them smile. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that, but I, as I, as one, I've seen several church signs, three or four church signs around the wherever in the United States. It says, uh, Do you spend as much time in the Bible as you do on your cell phone? I've seen that in several church signs out in the sign out in front of there. Uh, 2 Thessalonians 2. Uh, 2 Thessalonians 2, 13. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief the truth. God says, hey, so I'm going to send my son, die on the cross, shed his blood, death, burial, and resurrection, ascension back up to God the Father, going to come back and rapture the church. And anybody that put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ and his blood shed only just in Christ only and repents and receives Christ, God predestinated them to be conformed to the image of his dear son, Romans 8, 29 and 30. And God said, I have chosen them in Christ before the, found, before the foundation of the world. I'll choose that person. If they get in Christ, in my son, then I've chosen them. God did that before the foundation of the world. But you weren't in Christ before the foundation of the world. God just set up that plan before the foundation of the world that when he sent his son, you trust his son, you get in Christ, then you're chosen. You're not, you're not chosen until you get in Christ. That's the thing to get. Out of everything I just said in the last 10 minutes, the thing to get is you're not chosen until you get in Christ. You're not elected until you get saved. Until you get saved. Verse 14. Wherefore, or where to, where to, he called you by our gospel. To the obtain, he called you. See that? He didn't call you before the foundation of the world. What in the world? Where to, he, you weren't even born then. Where to, he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice it's always the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul is always concentrating on giving glory to Jesus Christ. Yeah. He's scared to death he's, that somebody's going to try to give him glory. And he didn't want nobody giving him glory. Yeah. 15. Therefore, brethren, stand fast. Oh, if there's ever a day and time, folks, we've got to stand fast. It's today. Yeah. There's a lot of discouraging things that happen all around us. And hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. Now notice the tradition mentioned there in chapter 3, verse 6. 3, 6. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, and not after the tradition which he received of us. Tradition. Now, there are some traditions that are not good. And there are some traditions which are good. Alright? Now, some traditions will prevent people from getting saved. Because when people say, I got my religion, I'll just stick to it. They're sticking to their religion and their traditions. All right, which if they're not biblical, then they're not saved. Now, Jesus said, talk about this. Turn to Mark 7 in, in the gospel there, Mark 7. And look what Jesus said to these people uh, about tradition in Mark chapter 7 and verse number 5. Mark 7, 5. Then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, Why walk not by disciples according to the tradition of the elders? but eat bread with unwashed hands. Look what they're worried about. And they're worried about washing hands, eating bread, but they have no problem in murdering the Son of God. Verse 6, He answered and said unto them, 
Well, half Isaiah's prophesied of you hypocrites. He calls them hypocrites. Praise God. As it is written, this people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. He said, you know, Isaiah prophesied of you people. And he did back in the book of Isaiah. Uh, verse 7. Howbeit in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines that the commandments of men, for laying aside the commandment of God. So they lay aside the commandment of God. What do they do? Ye hold the tradition of men. See, if the tradition of men, if it doesn't line up with the word of God, then you throw it in the, in the trash can. As the washing of pots and cups and many other such like things you do. And he said unto them, Full well you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your own tradition. People reject the commandment of God to keep their own tradition. Well, whatever tradition it might be. Well, it's, it's always been a tradition. Well, if the tradition is anti-Bible, throw it in the garbage can. Yeah. Yeah. Verse 10. See, See why I don't have a church of a thousand people? You think the average preacher would have said what I just said? They would have said, now if the traditions of men are different than what the Bible says, dearly beloved, then what we should do is we should so kindly ignore them. I just can't do that. It doesn't, it doesn't come across. Sorry. <laughs> Verse 10. For Moses said, honor thy I don't think Jesus talked like that either. For Moses said, and John the Baptist and, and Paul and a bunch of others. For Moses said, honor thy father and thy mother, and whoso curseth father and mother, let him die the death. But ye say, if a man shall say to his father or mother, it is Corban, that is to say, a gift, by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, he shall be free. Verse 12, and ye suffer him no more to do aught for his father or his mother. Verse 13, here it is, Mark 7, 13. Jesus Christ speaking, the Son of God, says what? Here it is. Making the word of God of none effect through your tradition, which ye have delivered, and many such like things ye do. People make the word of God of none effect. It has no effect. Because they'd rather trust in their own stinking, rotten, low-down religion and tradition. Yeah. And they die and go to hell. What a shame. Mm. All right? That's tradition. Back to 2 Thessalonians 2. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 15. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught whether by word, in other words, by the word, by somebody saying something to you, or our epistle, in other words, what we wrote in our epistles. Verse 16, now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us, praise God, he loved us, amen, amen. amen. and hath given us everlasting consolation. Consolation to console is to comfort. Consolation is comfort, all right? Uh, everlasting consolation and good hope through grace. Folks, you and I have good hope. We not only have hope, a lot of unsaved people say, well, I have hope in this and that or that. It's that amount of hill of beans a lot of times. We have good hope. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 19. For we are saved by hope, Romans 8, 24. But it's not a hope like, I hope I make it. I hope, ooh, I, hope I make it. That's what the average person, person thinks. It's not that. What is hope? Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtain a good report, Hebrews 11, verse 1 and 2. So, uh, now faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's only a hope. Heaven is only a hope. The Lord coming back, the second coming, which he mentions, by the way, a lot of times in 1st 2nd Thessalonians, these the new young converts, it's only a hope in that it hasn't been, become physically manifested yet. It's not a thing where we hope we're saved. I hope I make it. Oh, I hope I make it. I hope, I hope the Lord comes back. No, he is coming back. Yeah. And if you're saved, you are going to heaven. Yeah. Amen. Man makes it, man's got it all out of whack. Uh, 
Verse 16, Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace. 17, Comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. <coughs> establish you. He mentions this establish you through two or three or four times throughout 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. Establish you is... <coughs> An established Christian is one that's a stable, solid Christian uh, who has been through some trials, been through some fire in their life, the trial of your faith, been through the trial of their faith, have been tested and tried. They're, they're solid. They're stable. They've learned to, whatever state they're in, to be content. They realize that whatever they're going through, it's going to come to pass. They've been saved long enough, they've lived on the earth long enough to know that, you know, trials come and go, and uh, sometimes people come and go, and, and uh, tribulations come and go, and just a lot of things in life are not permanent, and they just roll with the punches. They, they're, sta they're established. Now look at the, over to the right, if you, uh, 1 Peter 5, and Peter talks about this. Uh, about And one of the ways that God establishes you, and I hate to tell you this, but one of the ways that God establishes you is through uh, trials and tribulations and some hard times. 1 Peter 5, verse 10. 1 Peter 5, 10. But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, after that you've suffered a while, make you what? Four things. Perfect, establish, there it is, establish, strengthen, settle you. God wants to perfect you, establish you, strengthen you, and settle you. One of the problems is, as a lot of people will not sit under a Bible-believing pastor and learn in the preaching and teaching of the Word of God and, and get fed the Word of God so they can grow in the Lord. Folks, it's the Word of God that does something in your heart and life. It's not Steve Cobel. It's not another preacher. Now, I can get up and teach and preach the Word of God, and these other preachers and teachers can get up and preach and teach the Word of God, and so forth. But it takes the Holy Spirit of God, and we have to be faithful in doing that. I agree with that. But it's the Holy Spirit that takes it and does something in your heart with it. Yeah. It perfects you. Yeah. It's, as we say, establish, E-S. Then we say, establish you strengthen you, settle you, settle. Concrete has to settle. All right? God wants you to be settled. He wants you to be established. He wants you to be strengthened. And uh, at verse 10, and after that you have suffered a while. That's what suffering does. It does those four things and many other things, but that's the four things that it does. All right, let's go back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And uh, notice here in uh, 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 17, Comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. In other words, good word, the words that come out of your mouth and the, the word of God and so forth, and work. All right, chapter 3, verse 1. Finally, brethren, Paul says that a few times, finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified even as it is with you. Now, he talks about this, the word of the Lord having free course. In other words, that the word of the Lord can work effectively. We're praying, and we pray every service that the word, right tonight, we're praying the word of God will have free course, that it will be able to work and move in people's hearts and lives. Uh, Paul mentions this, uh, Colossians 4.3. Uh, uh, well, I had it memorized, but I forgot. Colossians 4.3. With all praying also for us that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am also in bonds. So pray for us that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ. Pray for us. So he says the word of the Lord may have free course. Pray that we can, you know, pre preach and teach the word of God without a lot of opposition, without the stinking, rotten, low-down devil trying to hinder the word of God. 
that the word of God will have free course and be glorified even as it is with you. Now, Psalms 138.2 says, For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. So here in 2 Thessalonians 3.1, Paul says, Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified. The word of the Lord be glorified even as it is with you. Verse 2. And that we may be delivered. Here he is. He talks about what happened. He talks about what the free course really is referring to. Verse 2. That we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men. For all men have not faith. Now verse 1 and 2 applies to missionaries. It applies to any born again Christian witnessing and passing out tracts and inviting people to church. But verse 1 and 2 is a good missionary uh, part of a missionary letter. You know, and some missionaries have this as part of their letterhead. Finally, brethren, verse 1, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified even as it is with you, that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for all men have not faith. Well, that's the truth. All men have not faith. Now, it not only means that all men have not faith in the sense of faith in Jesus Christ. All men are not saved, obviously. But even a lot of professing saved people, they don't have faith. They don't see things the way they ought to see things because they've never really grown in the Lord. There are thousands and probably millions of born-again Christians around America and throughout the world. They're saved, but they've, they've grown about that much. About that much. They know about that much Bible. About that much. You say, why is that? Well, there's about 4,000 reasons. And one of them is... They never really got established in a good local Bible-believing, Bible-preaching, teaching church that believes the Bible, the King James Bible, that has the right Bible. You know what's wrong with a lot of churches? They don't have the right Bible, they don't have the right music, and they don't have the right doctrine. I'm not trying to be mean. I'm telling you the truth. I mean, there's churches all over this area. They don't have the right Bible, they don't have the right music, and they don't have the right doctrine on several things. What are you going to do with a person like that? You know how much they're going to grow in the Lord? About that much. And when you talk to them, you can tell it. You say, well, why don't they get... They don't want to. They like their little mamby-pamby preacher that says mamby-pamby-pamby, mamby-wamby-wamby. And don't say a whole lot. I'm not saying they're all like this. There's some preachers, thank God, around America that still preach the word of God and thank God for it. But a lot of them don't. And that's what a lot of them. For the time shall come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they keep to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth. Don't want to hear it. Yeah, don't you know what I'm saying? I don't want to hear it. No, no. I got my religion. I got my, I got my church. <clears throat> I know, but does the preacher say to preach and teach enough Bible to put in the left eye of a blind mosquito? No, not really, but I want to stay there because I, I love my church. There, it gets back to the heart thing. There's no desire for truth to learn more. They have a desire to go to the yard sales. They have a desire to go to the garage sale. They have a desire to go to Walmart. They've got a desire to go on vacation. They got a desire to raise their kids. They got a desire to go on their job and make their money. They got a desire to invest. They got a desire. Oh, that's great, wonderful. But when it comes to God and the things of God, and that's why God allowed a stolen election almost a year ago. And that's why God's allowed a lot of things in the last few months and years in America. And things will get probably worse and worse as the, this country continues to spit in his face. And that's just the way it is. We're no better than Israel. Yeah. The United States is no better. You think you and I as Christians are better than the first century Christians? Are we better than the Christians during the Reformation, 500 and 1500, who were burned at the stake? Had their eyes gouged out? Read Fox's Book of Martyrs. They put a cage on top of a man and woman's head and put rats in there and let them eat the top of their head and eat their eyeballs. They'd cut their, they'd get a family, a man and a wife and children. They'd watch the children. Uh, they'd let the children watch the, as they cut the mom and dad's heads off. 
the head go rolling. Blood squirting everywhere. These things happen. You know, so I never heard about it in the public school system. <laughs> I know you didn't. So the news media never, I oh, know you never will. Yeah. Nope. That's why they call it the dark ages. They, they, in public school system, they don't even talk about the dark ages. Because they know people ask, well, what does it mean dark ages? Why, why was it dark? Oh, my being spiritually dark. That's when John Huss and uh, and uh, that's when John Huss and uh, and Martin Luther and uh, what's the other guy's name? Uh, bunch of them were burned at the stake. Uh, Savonarola, uh, but were burned at the stake. This is the 1500s, and that's when Martin Luther come out of the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church and uh, they burned the Bibles. weren't allowed to have the Bibles or anything. That's why it's dark ages. And Martin Luther got a light on the fact that a person saved by grace through faith come out and started the Lutheran Church, 1500s. Henry VIII come out and started the Episcopal Church. Because the Catholic Church didn't want his divorce. He got a divorce. 800, 900, 1000 AD, something like that. I forget. 800 or 900 AD. 1500, the Reformation. When you study church history for the last 2,000 years from the time of Christ to right now, and you see the condition of the church. I didn't say the condition of unsaved people. That's bad enough. But the condition of the church. Uh, chapter 3, that's where we're trying to have revival. Chapter 3, verse 1, finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified even as it is with you, and that we may be delivered from unreasonable. You know, there's just some people that are unreasonable. They're just unreasonable. You can't, you can't even deal with them. And you know what you do? You just go on. Just pray for them. You know? But you can't. You know, Paul said in Romans 12, As much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Romans 12, 16 to 18 into there. As much as lieth in you, live, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably. In other words, everything, give it everything you got, but sometimes there's some people you just can't live peaceably with. And you just got to go on and serve God. Unreasonable and wicked men. Verse 3, 2 Thessalonians 3, 3. But the Lord is faithful. Thank God for that. Amen. Who shall establish you. There it is, establish it again. You see that? Back in verse uh, two, back in 2, 17, we just went over it. Comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. Chapter 3, verse 3, But the Lord is faithful who shall establish you. See, these were new converts. The church of Thessalonica were young Christians. That's why Paul dealt a lot with the second coming of Christ. You get a new convert think, knowing that Christ can come back any time. And you, I, I didn't mark them, but there's, there's at least four or five times in 1 and 2 Thessalonians that Paul mentions the coming of the Lord. The, second, the day of the Lord, the day of Christ, the second coming, and all that stuff. And Paul constantly emphasized that to these young Thessalonica Christians because he wanted to root them and ground them and establish them in the fact that the Lord's coming back. Because somebody wrote, as we said in 2 Thessalonians 2 1, now we beseech you, brother, by the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, by gathering together unto him, that you be not seen shaken in mind, or be troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us. 2 Thessalonians 2 2, we went over it. Paul, somebody forged a letter and said it was from Paul, and what, he didn't write it. And they basically tried to shake them in their mind that the Lord had already come back or that you know they didn't go up with the rapture or try to confuse them about the second coming of the Lord. So he said, don't be shaken in mind or be troubled either by spirit or by word or by letter as from us. I didn't write that letter. Whoever forged that letter, Paul said, I didn't write it. Somebody's trying to mess them up about the second coming. And we've got people today in the last 50 years. Books have been putting out that we're going to go through the tribulation. Well, that don't bring no comfort and establish your hearts. If you yeah. know you're going to go through the tribulation. Yeah. But you're, going to, you're not going to be going through the tribulation. You're going to be caught out of here. Amen. Yeah. Chapter 3, uh, verse 3, But the Lord is faithful. Uh, the faithfulness of God. The faithfulness of God. Uh, turn back to Psalms 89. And let me show you this. Psalms 89. And... Uh, Got to shout run the aisles on this one. Psalms 89, about the faithfulness of God. This chapter talks about the faithfulness of God. Psalms 89, verse 1. 
Psalms 89, 1. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness, faithfulness to all generations. Mm. Notice that, faithfulness. Verse 2, for I have said, mercy shall be built up forever. Thy faithfulness shalt thou establish in the very heavens. You see that? The faithfulness of God. All three. Verse 5, and the heavens shall praise thy wonders, O Lord, thy faithfulness also in the congregation of the saints. For who in the heaven can be compared unto the Lord? Oh, wow, nobody can. Who among the sons of the mighty can be likened unto the Lord? See that? God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints and, and, to, and to be had in reverence of all them that are, that are about him. See that? O Lord God of hosts, who is a strong Lord like unto thee? Or to thy faithfulness round about thee? See the faithfulness word all through these verses? Uh, thou rulest the raging of the sea. He rules the yes. raging of the sea. When the waves thereof arise, thou stillest them. He did that in the Gospels two or three times. Thou hast broken Rahab in pieces as one that is slain. Thou hast scattered thine enemies with thy strong arm. The heavens are thine. The earth also is thine. As for the world and the fullness thereof, thou hast founded them. Look down there at verse 24. Verse 24. But my faithfulness and my mercy shall be with him. God says, and in my name shall his horn be exalted. Verse 33. 33. Nevertheless, my loving kindness will I not utterly take from him, nor suffer my faithfulness to fail. Talking about the covenant here. And... Uh, covenant with David there and his covenant that he will not uh, break with David there. Six times faithfulness is mentioned in Psalms 89. At least six verses there. Uh, Psalms 36 5 says, Thy mercy, O Lord, is in the heavens, and thy faithfulness reacheth unto the clouds. Lamentations 3, verse 22 and 23, It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. Because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. We got the song. Great is thy faithfulness. Yeah. Revelation 19.11 And I saw heaven opened and a, behold a white horse and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. Now I got a little message I preach. I preached it here a few years ago. Thank you. I'll give you the outline real quick. We'll move on here. But uh, he's faithful, number one. He says here in 2 Thessalonians 3, 3, but the Lord is faithful. Number one, he's faithful to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's 1 John 1, 9. If we can, it's written to save people. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Yeah. Understand something. Nowhere, as far as I know, now there, there, might, I, there might be, I don't know, but as a general standard rule, an unsaved person doesn't confess their sins. They confess Christ, Romans 10, 9 and 10, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, shalt believe in thine heart that God raised from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For the heart man believes unto righteousness, mouth confession is made unto salvation. They confess Christ. An unsaved person can come down here tonight and confess every sin they've ever committed for four and a half hours until midnight tonight and still be lost. They have to repent of their sins, ask God to forgive them, and come into their heart and save their soul from hell. A saved person doesn't have to ask God to come into their heart and save their soul. They already did that when they got saved. They have to confess their sins to God. Confess them. God, I've done this. Name it. I've done that. I'm sorry. I name it. If we, say people, confess our sins, he is faithful, faithful, and just to forgive us our sins. Not just to forgive us, listen to this, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen. Amen. He'll not only forgive you, he'll cleanse you. 1 John 1, 9. But it's so hard for the human race to do that because we're full of pride. But... I'll tell you how you get God's attention when you humble yourself. You want God to have mercy on you? You humble yourself. 
And God will have mercy. He resisteth the proud and giveth grace unto the humble. Uh, let's see, 1 Peter 5 5. Humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Uh, uh, see, James 4 10. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, he shall lift you up. Humility gets God's attention. I'm not, I'm not talking about you know phony baloney humility, false pretense thing. I'm talking about real. They called Moses the meekest man on the earth, but he killed a man. Being meek doesn't mean you're weak. Being meek is not weak. Jesus Christ said, "For I am meek and lowly in heart." Matthew eleven twenty eight and twenty nine. You think he was weak? Meekness, a lot of men have a problem with meekness because they think, you know, I want to be a macho man. <laughs> I'll show them I'm a macho I am. Generally, the man that is the meekest is the spiritual man. That's the spiritual man. He's not weak, but he's meek. He knows who he is. He knows who he is in Christ. He knows through Christ he can do all things, but he's not weak. He's stable, he's solid, he's spiritual, he's been established. We just went over those verses. All right, so number one, uh, he's faithful to forgive and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Number two, he's faithful to establish and to keep you from evil. Right here in 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 3, but the Lord is faithful who shall establish you and keep you from evil. If you want to be kept from evil, God can keep you from evil. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will the temptation also make a way to escape, that you may be able to bear it. That's 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13. So he's also, that's the third thing. He's, uh, he's faithful to not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able. Above that you are able. God knows what you're able to withstand. God stopped Abimelech. Remember, we went over in Genesis. God stopped Abimelech from sinning and taking Abraham's wife, Sarah. After Abraham and Sarah both lied to an unsaved heathen king about her being a... They, Abraham said, tell him that you're my sister, not my wife. Because you tell him I, you're my wife. Remember, he did it twice in Genesis. Because she's a fair woman. She's a good-looking woman. And, and, you know, he knew these bunch of men. And they, they, they're going to kill him. If you tell him that you're my wife, they're going to kill me and take you. So just tell him, you said, well, wouldn't, wouldn't they have done it if you told them it was your sister too? Well, I guess not, because they didn't. So he lied. He was afraid. People, you know when people lie? When they get afraid. Uh, so number three, he's uh, he's uh, He's faithful to not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able. And then uh, number four, he's faithful to fulfill all of his promises. He's faithful to fulfill all of his promises. Where's that at, preacher? Hebrews 11.11. 11. Hebrews 11.11. 11. Through faith, also, Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Yeah. We went over that in Genesis. I heard her having the baby. Her and Abraham. All right? So she judged him faithful, talking about God being faithful who had promised. So he's faithful to fulfill all of his promises. Whatever God promised, he's faithful to fulfill every one of them. Yeah. There's hundreds and hundreds of promises in the Bible. And then next to all, let me say this. He's faithful to present you faultless and blameless. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 and 24. Present you faultless and blameless. Paul said, I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Spirit, soul, body. I mentioned many times, won't go into all of it. 
that every human being is a trichotomy. You're a live body, a live soul, and a dead spirit when you're born in your mother's womb. You're spiritually dead when you're born in your mother's womb. You're born dead in trespasses and sins. And when you got saved, born again, if you're saved, your spirit was regenerated, your soul was saved, and nothing happened to your flesh. You're waiting for the redemption of your body, Romans 8, 24 and 25. Nothing's happened to your body. You still got the same old stinking rotten low down flesh. The only thing now is after you got saved, you got a war. The flesh wars against the spirit, the new man. And that's why the devil fight the, the, the old man and the devil both. There's a difference between the old man, the flesh, and the devil. There's two different enemies there. They both fight you about doing anything for God. Isn't that something? The devil and your old flesh. Paul talked about that. This I say, then walk in the spirit, you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Galatians 5, 16 and 17. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. So if you feed the spirit man more with the things of God, the Bible, prayer, church, hearing, preaching, teaching the word of God, he's going to be able to tear up that old man. But like a lot of people, they feed the old man more filth and junk and trash of the world, and therefore the spirit man is barely surviving, hanging in there, and they end up walking in the flesh and fulfilling the lust of the flesh and the desires of the flesh. And therefore, when you see a lot of Christians in America today, they look like this. What are you so happy about? <laughs> That's what happens when you walk in this flesh. <coughs> and then uh, he's a faithful high priest. I won't read him, but that's in uh, that's in Hebrews chapter two, verse seventeen and eighteen, and Hebrews ten, verse nineteen to twenty three. He's a faithful high priest. That's a little message I preached, I think, a few years ago here on the faithfulness of God. So here, back to 2 Thessalonians 3, 3. But the Lord is faithful, who shall establish you and keep you from evil. Verse 4. And we have confidence in the Lord touching you. In other words, concerning you, touching you. We have confidence in the Lord touching you, that ye both do and will do the things which we command you. So Paul had some confidence in these folks, you know, that they, touching them, touching you, that you both do, they do right now, and will do, future, the things which we command you. Verse 5, and the Lord, and, that, and when you do the things, and are doing the things that we commanded you, verse 5, what will happen? And the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God, and into the patient waiting for the tribulation. Is that what it says? Nope. And the patient waiting for the Antichrist. We're not waiting for the Antichrist. We're not waiting for the tribulation. We're not waiting for the time of Jacob's trouble. It's referred to in Jeremiah 30. The time of Jacob's trouble is the, is the uh, tribulation. It's when God starts dealing with that Jew again. But before he starts doing that, he raptures the church out of here. That's why it's called the time of Jacob's trouble. That Jew has to endure into the end. Matthew 24. Pray that your flight be not in the winter, Jesus said in Matthew 24. Don't go back in the house and get your stuff, he said. All that. Woe to them that are with suck and with child in that day. Because you got to run. you got to run. you got to use your legs. Remember, I went over that. Uh, verse 5, because the Antichrist is going to be after going to break that uh, covenant there. And Daniel talks about it. We went over that in the first, the first study of the book of Daniel. Verse 5, and the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patient waiting for Christ. Now he's going to turn the corner a little bit here and go over something a little different. We, we only got a minute or two here, so we just we'll be able to touch this here and then we've got to stop. Verse 6, now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, and not after the tradition which he received of us. Now this is talking about Secondary separation is what I call it, a lot of preachers do. Primary separation is about be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. All right? In other words, you can't be careful who you hobnob around with unbelievers. 
But this here is talking about withdrawing yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly. All right? And uh, now, we'll go over the verses next time, but 1 Corinthians 5, 1 to 13, a man in the church was committing fornication with his father's wife, and Paul said to uh, purge out that one. In other words, get rid, perform church discipline on him. All right, and then 1 Timothy 6, verse 3 to 6, uh, Paul talks about withdrawing yourselves from a brother that walks in a certain way. And I'll close this. Uh, I'll close by saying this. Americans have become very soft. Now, it's hard enough to get people to come to church in the day and time we live in, so a lot of preachers, they dare not ch practice church discipline. Church discipline is to get the person right with God. It's not to be mean to the person. It's to get them right with God. I'll close and give you this. Three scenes. Americans have become soft to church discipline. There's people that'll leave your church if you just have church to perform this church discipline. Uh, you got to do it in the right way. Uh, corporal punishment, spanking your children for doing wrong, and capital punishment, which the Bible teaches. Three C's. Americans have become soft to church discipline, corporal punishment for the children, and capital punishment, uh, the death penalty for those that murder. All right.